Okay, welcome to this part three of the Opportunity Zones Meetup that is hosted by Dakin Capital. I am your presenter tonight, Carl Dakin, and we are talking uh, at this event about the subject of offering documents within the framework of raising money into an Opportunity Zone fund and then deploying those funds into one or more Opportunity Zone businesses or properties. Uh, at this point in tonight's program, we're going to talk about the process uh, because not all the documents are needed at the very front end of a multiple staged um, program, uh, a capital campaign uh, when it's run uh, correctly. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of filtering in an attempt to quickly identify and qualify potential investors without spending any significant amount of time uh, so that when there is a good match between an investor and an opportunity, uh, the good time can be concentrated upon communicating uh, the elements of that particular opportunity in a way where uh, there is a higher uh, chance that this will lead to a close. So uh, at this point, uh, one of the things that a lot of uh, people do not do in raising capital, which I highly recommend they adopt as a practice, is test your offering. Um, I don't know how many times I've been involved in an offering that's come out of the gate and did not move an inch after the initial pitch was made. Uh, it was in the wrong time, wrong place, wrong deal, being offered to the wrong people, and no money was raised. Uh, I've been involved with a number where a little amount of money was raised, typically from a close network around the person who was seeking to raise money, which might be considered friends and family or associates, but uh, we didn't get into the masses. We didn't get into the volumes needed. And there was a general assumption that uh, because I'm looking for money, somebody's going to write me a check. And if I don't know them today, I'll just keep on this campaign trail until we get there. And, and again, I know of a number of examples where uh, even good operating businesses with margins fell back. They become distracted by the capital campaign and lost ground and lost sales and then found themselves unfundable uh, because uh, their forward momentum had reversed and the investors lost confidence in them and they couldn't get new investors to come to the table. So uh, I suggest uh, identifying the different target markets that uh, should be interested. Uh, we talked about stakeholders last time and it's gonna be in the guide that Nate and I are trying to finish right now for the last program uh, and within that, uh, with each particular group, think of a different deal and then uh, go talk to somebody. Try to find somebody who seems predisposed, hopefully somebody you already know, but uh, tell them to be objective, tell them to be hard on you, and just say, what's, does this deal make any sense to you? What would make it better? Uh, is it changing the price of money, creating a higher ROI? Is it putting more planning into the exit? Is it taking a real estate project, as we've been talking number, and putting an innovation hub in it as a de-risking mechanism? Uh, what else can we do to make this more attractive to you? Because every one of these, there, there's, as I said, we've got all these zones in Colorado and multiple projects in Colorado. There's 8,700 zones across the United States and the territories. There are probably over, I'm going to guess, 20,000 raises going on right now on Opportunity Zones. And I expect that will climb to over 100,000 um, by the end of this year as people become more comfortable and we're seeing more and more projects come in. You're competing against all of that. The noise level is going to get higher and higher and higher. Uh, your ability to differentiate yourself is very, very important. And uh, so you want to be asking these questions when you're testing your offering to find out what you can do to make it stand out, to make it remarkable, to make it something that the person who invests wants to tell their best buddy about uh, so that they can invest in the same thing. Then once you've tested it, and you've kind of drilled down, you may still end up with an offering that has multiple deals in it, in each of these targeted to different investors or different thresholds of money. Um, and um, so um, you then uh, go to your pitch. Uh, again, the pitch is, for, is a filtering process. It's to make you visible so people can see you. It's for people to gain interest in what you are. 
but people don't pick up checks during the pitch. Uh, you'll see this on TV, Shark Tank. You'll see it on a variety of uh, different competitions. Well, look, I got a check. Well, did they write the check at the end of the program uh, without any, you know, no preparation, or did they go through a long due diligence process, get to know you thing? And basically, my experience has been most checks are not written in less than six months from the date the two people first meet. They have to get comfortable with each other before they're going to make an investment. And when you're working on the clock of an opportunity zone where the investor has to put their money into a fund within 180 days after recognizing that gain, and then the fund has to make another investment, deploy that within the next 180 days, then what we're, we're sitting on is a situation where there's not enough time to get to meet people in the ordinary sense of things. You can't take the time to say, hey, yeah, let's go have coffee four or five times, a couple lunches, let's go out together. You've got to be in motion. And so your pitch is intended to be, do you qualify? No. Qualify? No. You're looking for quick no's, not slow maybes. You want people to clearly be positioned. You want to already know why they need this or why they want this, and you need to be able to communicate to them. But you can't do all that in a pitch, and it's not intended to be. This is the whole purpose of a pitch is to identify, qualify, and then set a second meeting. So it has to be short, has to be succinct. It needs to uh, basically raise all the different reasons, all the hot buttons that somebody might invest, and it has to allow for contact to follow on and set the table for doing that. Uh, I've seen pitches with thousands and thousands of words, and you get lost in the detail, and it basically demonstrates the person making the pitch is probably not that professional, probably not that credible. Uh, people are looking for any excuse at all to say no to a deal. And if you stand up with a 10,000 word pitch, you just gave them another one for saying no. So after the pitch, after you get your second meeting, then we're into the show. This is where you have to provide enough information to the investor candidate that they can make an informed investment decision. So by that very simple statement, I've opened the door to the person who's done 40 deals they're all in the real estate multifamily area. If I walk in with a multifamily plan, they probably know 10 times more about the deal than I do without me saying anything more because this is their type of deal. They've been there, done that. They're going to do it again. If I walk into someone who's never invested in multifamily before, they have a long educational curve. They may still invest, but they don't know all these things, and you have to kind of bring them up to speed as rapidly as possible. You have to give them that information. And you've got to do it to a level of detail that under securities law is called a disclosure of all material facts. And what does that mean? That means that if the deal goes bad, you didn't leave something out. And that's a rear view hindsight 2020 vision that you may not get to today. Uh, we had a major project uh, that was um, basically toasted by the terrorist attack on the World Trade Towers, uh, a terrorist attack we went back through our disclosures. We had not referenced terrorist anyway as a potential cause of failure of our, our thing, but fortunately nobody else thought that we should be held to that standard either. But these are the, as the kind of things that you're looking at. But if you put something in like, uh, oh, we may uh, be delayed because the city won't grant us a permit, uh, that would be ordinary in any kind of a residential thing. But a person who's never been through this, who's never invested in residential, won't know that that is a problem that can come up. So you want to put it in to your documents to explain why you might not get done on time, why there might be a reduced ROI, why there might be a delayed exit for that particular project. All that information has to be there. You want it to be clear. You want it to be concise. You want it to be professional. And you want to do it in as little space and time as possible. Uh, a lot of the professional investors, angels, won't even look at most of your documents. They'll open it up. They'll look for how much they get for their money. They'll flip to the projection page. They do their own discounting of what they think they, uh, that you've overstated the earnings to make it attractive, and they're done. Uh, and they're looking at you as the person who's leading the team or on the team, and they're making an immediate assessment. This person knows what they're doing or they don't. And then depend upon their risk factor or how much money may be involved, they're in or they're out, and it's a five-minute review. But they need to see all these documents because it's expected. It's part of the, the, this is what you do. And if you haven't done this work and you haven't done it correctly, your credibility goes down. Uh, people walked in the room and says, well, we're going to develop this property. 
where is it at? Well, I don't have the title on it. We go through all these different things, and you're, just, you're dead in the water at that point. So in this part, we've got the entire show has got to be made. Then the last part is the close. This is basically taken up in the form of the investment agreement. And uh, it's surprising how many times investment agreements either detract from the presentation or have an inconsistency between the presentation in the show and in the contract. And any inconsistency is something that causes concern. Concern is bad uh, because they're losing confidence again in the deal. So I talked earlier about harmonization. Uh, this is one of the documents that needs to be fully harmonized with all the offering, with all the promotional documents, with the pitch. And it should be as clear as possible. Uh, again, I've worked with documents, including form documents uh, provided by the local real estate board, uh, which are totally unclear and incomprehensible and so vague that you could drive buses and airplanes through them. And yet this is the standard in the industry. And so you may want to do something to help clarify that with schedules or amendments or charts or something at the back end that's attached to the agreement. So it makes it easier to understand how the agreement actually works. Question. Yes. Is that agreement you're talking about, is that a subscription agreement in, in terms of an offering? Yeah, it, it's called a subscription agreement or shareholder agreement or member agreement or investment agreement. There's a variety of terms uh, that apply to it. Uh, but they all have to do with your right to participate in this opportunity and what you're going to give up in order to get that. Now, the simpler ones, that's all it is. I put my money in, I cross my fingers. Uh, what we're talking about are these, if you start building in a cash exit or a controlled or influenced exit at the back end, there's got to be a whole lot more in there in terms of the obligations and whether they're absolute obligations or as in our Sugar Beet District project, they're they're basically, they're our option at our discretion. If we get to the end of the 10 years and the economy has gone upside down, we'll say, no, we're not going to call the option. The investor is going to have to be on their own to sell out their own interest. And that's a risk that they really don't want to have. They would prefer some kind of certainty. But again, if there were certainty, then they wouldn't be getting these kinds of rates of return. So it, it, there is a balancing that takes place there. But yeah, it's a formal agreement. And this agreement is uh, often one that uh, some people will look at first, uh, even though they may be difficult to interpret or they've been written in legalese to the point of uh, beyond comprehension. Uh, I hate seeing a, a document where uh, I can read it for two hours and I walk away and I'm still not sure what I read. And people tell me, just sign it. it. It doesn't do a lot for me. So this is the third part. But actually, the way I would recommend it, there should be four parts. Do your deal uh, test first. Verify that people will invest in what you're going to do. Then make a pitch that really sings your praises in the best possible fashion to get the most interest. But don't go high on detail. Don't lock yourself in. You don't have to give away the hard numbers. Just get them interested. Then in the second one, you're going, this is what we're trying to do. And if you have flexibility, and as we had an example with Jeff's project earlier, he's got two ways already on the table, and he may come up with three or four different deal structures, which are all basically looking to different investors who have a different motive, different time of duration of their investment, different ROI, different risk threshold. And there's different things you can do with that as well uh, to uh, stack different types of capital, uh, doing an upfront with a back end mortgage because you're in a rural area, you've got all the USDA programs sitting out there also that are available to you. The state of Colorado has a number of economic ones from the C-PACE program for environmental retrofit of a building that can create a different type of money. Uh, you might qualify for a jumpstart program by putting in a data processing center for the first time out there. Other things may come up. And what I really like about this is that uh, other than a 1031 uh, rollover, uh, all other forms of credits, incentives, economic benefits are all potentially available to you. And if you can stack up 8, 9, 10, or 12 of those, you should do that uh, because it, it just makes your deal that much uh, better. And that brings us to the end of part three.